<coughs> hello everyone. My name is uh, Mohammed Ben Hawi, uh, ENT specialist and one of the admin of uh, Egyptian ENT forum. Uh, today will be uh, the second uh, day for panel discussion, which it is uh, autology panel discussion. Uh, so uh, I will welcome and introduce our professors, uh, which uh, who will be the first is uh, uh, our professor uh, Ali Mahrous, who supporting our group uh, all the time, morally and scientifically, and uh, he will be the moderator. Uh, uh, nice to meet you, uh, Dr. Ali. And uh, I will welcome uh, our uh, uh, professors, uh, international speakers, uh, uh, Professor uh, Robert. Hello, Professor Robert. Hello, nice to be with you. Uh, yeah, me too. And uh, we will welcome also for Professor uh, Timon from UK. Hello, thank nice you for the invitation. You. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you are welcome. And you, uh, we will welcome also for our professor, uh, uh, Dr. Aziz uh, from uh, uh, from Alexandria, Egypt. Nice to meet you, Dr. Aziz. Hello. And uh, for Dr. Saad, uh, he will join us now. Yeah, nice to meet you, Dr. Saad. Do you hear us, uh, Dr. Saad? Dr. Saad? I think he have now he has a, a, a trouble connection now. So we can start now, uh, uh, Dr. Ali. Ahlan uh, bahadaratkum jamiyan. كل سنة وحضراتكم طيبين وبصحة وسلامة. الحقيقة في البداية يعني يعني هستأذنكم بقى نخرج شوية عن الفورمات العادي بتاع ال. المحاضرات اللي عدت وهنتكلم الحقيقة النهاردة يعني مضطرين نتكلم باللغة الإنجليزية طول الوقت لأن عندنا طبعا ضيوف أجانب زي ما أنتم عارفين ويعني أتمنى إن شاء الله يبقى panel discussion مفيد لينا كلنا هو الحقيقة الأسئلة أسئلة بتاعتكم أنتم فيعني دي أنا بس بقدم الأسئلة بتاعتكم بشكل panel format يعني Good evening everyone uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, our uh, uh, panelists from abroad, uh, namely Dr. Vincent from France, uh, Professor Simon Lloyd from the UK. Uh, equally important is to thank our national panelists, uh, namely Professor Aziz and the Professor Saad Um uh, Robert Vincent. Uh, is an autologic uh, surgeon uh, from France. Uh, he joined Cosé uh, Clinic in 1991, and he has performed more than 7,300 operations for autosclerosis and more than 4,000 ossicular reconstruction uh, surgeries and more than 260 operations for congenital malformation of the ossicular chain. This is a humongous number of surgical cases which reflect a, a vast experience uh, in the field of autology. Uh, not only uh, that, but uh, Robert is actually a general secretary and co-founder co of Lion. Uh, and, and all of us in Egypt know Lion. Lion is basically the Life uh, International Autolaryngology Network, which is actually based in Europe but it's being watched everywhere in the world. Uh, and it's actually a live, free of a charge, uh, very educational surgical uh, website. And I will take this uh, opportunity to actually uh, invite you on behalf of uh, Dr. Vincent uh, to attend the uh, Lion uh, uh, Network uh, on the 18th and 19th of May uh, this year. And uh, I would ask you kindly to pre-register uh, beforehand on the website that we, you all know of. Um, Robert is also the uh, editorial board of many international respectable journals. So welcome, Robert. Um, 
Simon Lloyd. Uh, Simon is actually a professor of uh, otology and skull based surgery in Manchester Royal Infirmary. Uh, Simon is not just trained in the UK, he's been actually trained in the UK, uh, in the USA, and in Copenhagen as well. He was awarded the Dalby uh, Prize in 2017 by the Royal Society of Medicine as the greatest contributor uh, to the otology research in the UK in the last five years. And he's the first UK surgeon to introduce gentamicin prehab to patients undergoing vestibular schwannoma surgery. Simon is the secretary of the British Society of Skull Base and Autology Society as well, and many, many more. Uh, mm -hmm. Professor Aziz Bilal uh, is well known in Egypt, uh, in the region, and in actually in the world. Uh, Aziz is, is, is uh, a professor of autology uh, in one of the deeply rooted medical schools in Egypt, Alexandria. And he's the ex-dean, actually the youngest dean in his time in uh, Alexandria Medical School. Uh, Aziz has uh, uh, spent several years uh, as a fellow of Chocnet in the USA, in the, uh, I, I take it in the 70s or, or thereabout. And he's actually, uh, this has added a lot to the depth of understanding of the autology, particularly the pathology of the temporal uh, bone. Uh, last but not least, we have uh, Dr. Saad Zayad from uh, Kafr Sheikh. Uh, he's the, uh, uh, the chairman of ORL department there, and he spent a few years in, in France. Thank you. So, can you show me the idea? Um, sorry for this technical issue. Um, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have the top-notch panelists tonight, and let us hope that this would be reflected on the benefit that you're going to get uh, at the end of our uh, panel discussion. And before we embark on the panel discussion, I'd like to make a few points. Uh, the first point is meant for the respectable panelists, uh, essentially to state that this platform, which is the Egyptian ENT network, is founded by the junior and middle grade doctors in Egypt. And it is meant to exchange experience uh, in the field of ORL. And the direct, uh, the, the classic example, if any of the doctors uh, confront a difficult clinical scenario, they would actually present it on this platform to get the direct experience of their seniors. Uh, therefore, I would urgently ask you as panelists to keep it as basic as possible, but to keep it precise, concise, and to the point. Uh, the last point I'd like to make is to make a disclaimer that this platform that we are all talking from is actually uh, neither governmental nor profitable uh, platform. So there are no conflicting interests or any financial uh, issues to be disclosed. Um, now, uh, we're going to go for the uh, panel uh, discussion that is actually titled Current Thinking of Temporal And uh, as you all know, that Temporoplasty is a reconstructive surgery of the tympanic membrane and all the ossicles with or without mastodectin. So, if we think that tympanoplasty is just to repair the drum head, then we have lost the plot. Whenever we have a perforation of the tympanic membrane, we need to just to think beyond the tympanic membrane, which is to uh, think of the middle ear cleft, including the ossicles, as well as the mastoid as well. So um, the primary classification of tympanoplasty is the actually Wallerstein classification, which has been there uh, around for more than 60 years. Um, now, the question is to uh, Dr. Robert Vincent. Um, do you know of any, or oh, actually, if there, are there any pros and cons for this classification, uh, Robert? I'm not sure I understood your question about this classification because I don't use it myself. 
um, I so mainly the use classification basically as you can see it on the screen it's a type 1 tympanoplasty yeah I, I don't see the I don't see the the, the picture on the screen um, but, so uh, can, can we make it oh. visible then, Muhammad okay no. yeah yeah that's fine then all right can, can you see it now yeah well I'm not using this classification uh, yeah. I use the, uh, but it's mainly for acicular reconstruction. I use the Austin Cartouche uh, classification, but uh, I mean, this one is, of course, very well known. So I don't say, I, I cannot say many words about that because I'm not really using it. In my opinion, this is a little bit too small in terms of groups. There are a lot of missing uh, other groups, and including in the Austin Cartouche classification. Some of them is still missing. We still miss the fact, for example, that we are a state is fixed plus absence of malice, something like that. So that's a very important point, I think. Uh, right. So uh, essentially, you um, you don't use it because it's not uh, clinically applicable. Is that what you mean? Or? No, no. It is clinically applicable, but it, it's yeah. for, to me, it's not enough to have only four groups. Because there are much more different situations than only uh, these three. I, w I wouldn't say about a type 1, which is only meringoplasty, but the, the other one, type 2, 3, and 4, are uh, related to the status of the ossicular chain. And right. I think uh, we have much more uh, different types of situation which needs to be uh, uh, classified. And with the Austin cartouche, they are a little bit more than this. It's not perfect, but it's a little bit better to, than, than this one. According to me, of course, that's is, only my Austin, position. Is Austin Cartouche classification uh, differentiated between type 1 tympanoplasty and marengoplasty? Because this is a question for one of the target audience, actually. Um, yeah. um, so the, do, do you distinguish between the two, uh, Robert? No, in, in fact, in Austin Cartouche, it's mainly for ossicular, uh, ossicular chain issues, ossicular chain problem. doesn't talk about marengoplasty. So it's group A, B, C, D, E, and F, and each group corresponds to a different situation. For example, group A is presence of malice and stapes. Group B is presence of malice and absence of stapes superstructure with the mobile right. phosphate. Group C is a mobile stapes with absence of malice. Group D is absence of malice and stapes. And then group F, for example, is fix, uh, stapes fixation, which is a little right. bit better than the only three groups, but it's not perfect at all. Is still missing some other things. Great. So, so Simon, do you use the, this classification in the UK or or uh, the Austin cartouche as well? No, we we use the terms uh, type one quite frequently, and we use the term type three quite frequently. Um, but the other types we don't really use, and I think that class or well, any classification system really needs to have a clin clinical application. And I, I think. That classification system was designed in 1956 when our practices were very different and the surgical options that are available now for patients with uh, acicular uh, injuries is, is much different com compared to how it was in 1956. And I don't think most of those types within that classification really relate very well to current um, otological practice. Right. So uh, would you make any distinction in the UK between myringoplasty and type 1 tympanoplasty? No, broadly speaking, they're the same. Right. OK. So that is the answer to a question from uh, Osama Bissar. Uh, so now, uh, this question, I would like to actually direct it to Simon Lloyd. Uh, you know, Simon, whenever uh, we uh, see patients, um, with this, uh, if you have a patient coming to you with, the, with, this, with this audiogram of bilateral conductive hearing loss, the, the, can you see it on the screen on the right side? I can, yeah, I can see it now. Yeah. And, and, and another patient, uh, the screen on the left side, which is actually unilateral conductive hearing loss. Okay. It's, now, quite, it's quite small, actually, but oh, yeah, I can, I can, yeah, that's right. Nice. Well, essentially, one side is perfectly normal hearing. And the other side is a conductive hearing loss. Okay. Now, um, when you try to counsel these two patients, two different patients, one with bilateral conductive hearing loss, almost symmetrical on both sides, and the yeah. other with normal hearing on one side with a maximum conductive hearing loss on the other side. Now, would you actually apply 
the Glasgow benefit plot anymore, or we use the Belfast uh, uh, rule of thumb uh, to counsel these patients? Uh, sort of. Uh, I don't really use the Glasgow benefit plot. I, I can't really see a, a strong reason to use that in individual cases. But I think when you're publishing results and looking at changes in um, results within groups, then the Glasgow benefit plot can be quite helpful because you can see how people change from one group to another. Um, the Glasgow, uh, the um, uh, Belfast rule of thumb, I do think that actually is quite helpful. Um, so what you need to try and aim for is to bring the uh, hearing in the ear that you're operating on to within 15 decibels of the other ear if they're going to get significant benefit from it. And I think that does still stand um, in, in clinical practice today. And I, I counsel patients if, if we're not able to get or are unable or unlikely to get close to that, then I, I counsel them against a, uh, an acicular plasty. But the only caveat to that I would say is that um, you can sometimes bring patients um, within aidable hearing levels by improving their conductive hearing loss, even in the presence of a significant uh, sensory neural hearing loss. So there are certain circumstances where you might not um, stick to the Belfast rule of thumb, but but broadly right. speaking, I tend to. Yeah, but if you've been given the uh, opportunity to actually uh, operate on in either of these patients, which one would you probably, uh, not guarantee, but you give them a better chance to improve their hearing? Would you uh, choose the patient with the audiogram on the right-hand side, or would you choose the patient on the left-hand side? It depends on the circumstances and what the cause of the conductive hearing loss is. Um, right. So, if, if, you've got a, if you've got a unilateral otosclerosis, then that no, patient... No, we're talking about the central perforation here, actually. Bilateral uh, uh, mucosal type chronic otitis media, the central perforation, dry central perforation. For the one on the left? Both of them. Both of them, okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, it again, it depends on the status of the acicular chain. So, you know, if you've got a stay piece superstructure present, then the chances of successfully uh, improving the hearing to within 10 or 15 decibels of the other ear are much higher than they would be if the stay piece superstructure is absent. Um, right. So I'd have to assess that at the time of the surgery. Great. So um, it all depends on the status of the acicular chain and what have you, yeah? Absolutely. Great. So uh, this question is for our great Professor Aziz Bilal. Um, you've seen this patient, uh, Professor Bilal, in, in your clinic coming to you with uh, this kind of subtotal uh, perforation, uh, uh, almost invisible uh, anterior rim of the tympanic membrane, uh, with the other side having perfectly normal hearing. Um, how would you counsel them in your clinic, Prof. Bilal, and how would you deal with this kind of no REM anteriorly? Uh, can I go back to the question you asked uh, to Simon about the difference between maringoplasty and tympanoplasty 1? Because yeah. there is a difference. The difference is whether you do an exploratory tympanotomy, whether you turn a flap or you don't turn a flap. So if you don't turn a flap, like in uh, fat myringoplasty, if you're doing overlay my, uh, uh, myringoplasty, you don't explore the middle ear, and this is when you call it myringoplasty. Right. If you turn a flap and explore the middle ear for the ossicles, then you call it tympanoplasty one. And right. I think this is a, a critical difference in the technique. Right. About the subtotal uh, perforation, with uh, the anterior uh, rim uh, is uh, is almost gone. Uh, you create uh, an anterior rim, so I always use a piece of uh, of cartilage anteriorly under the grafts uh, to support my my facial graft or uh, perichondrium graft anteriorly and uh, try to elevate a little bit the, 
the skin of the anterior wall and uh, put the, the graft a little bit under the skin there. So uh, you can create an anterior, uh, there is a, a post-operative blunting in those cases, but this is usually the technique we use to avoid that the uh, underlay graft would fall into the middle ear. So essentially you're going to use uh, a, a, both a cartilage and fascia. Uh, a temporary uh, actually two pericondrium of... pericondrium with cartilage right and and um and, and you do it in an underlay technique always underlay so you you don't use a, a kind of overlay technique in these patients because uh, overlay technique is well known that you would avoid blunting is that something that you would contemplate with the this overlay technique, technique? Yeah. The overlay technique, one of the inherent advantage of the overlay is that basically, uh, because you're not going to disturb the annulus, uh, then there would be no blunting at all. Uh, would you? Uh, I'm, uh, you don't really, uh, you're not a fan of it. I, I think this is the reverse of what uh, we've seen and even temporal bone uh, postoperatively where uh, overlay uh, technique uh, almost causes in everything in either lateralization or blunting of the anterior angle. And this is one of the disadvantages of overlay. I thought that this is why we stopped doing overlays. Right. Um, so the question to Professor Saad Zayat here is that, uh, Saad, would you request a CT scan for mucosal coronic otitis media? You have a patient with a dry central perforation, or actually with a central perforation. Would you request a scan for these patients? Saad, can you hear us? Dr. Saad. Uh, it, it, it seems that there are technical issues with Saad there. So can I uh, divert this question to uh, Robert? Robert, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, right. Usually, uh, we don't we don't ask for a CT scan. And I, I just come back for the uh, what has he said. I fully agree. I do overlay technique because there is no perfect technique, and uh, whatever you do, there's always a problem. With uh, underlay technique, the risk is to have the graph falling down, and with overlay technique, the risk is blunting or lateralization of the tympanic membrane. So it's clear. We have some techniques to decrease that to decrease the risk. I always put the graft over the bony canal wall and over the malleus sandal. And at the end of the surgery, I will plug completely the anterior angle and also the full canal with gel foam to try to keep uh, the graft down, down into the uh, ear canal and to try to preserve, to reconstruct the anterior annulus. But it's not so easy. But usually, to uh, answer to your question, if I have a, a regular tympanic membrane perforation, uh, if there is no issue about uh, risk of cholesteatoma, I usually do not ask for a, for a CT scan, except if we have a really uh, bad mucosa, of course, I, will, I would ask for a CT scan in that case, but only in this case. So, so if you have a patient with a, with a center perforation, but the ear is persistently discharging, then you may request a scan. Is that you it depends. So, you know, it's always difficult to answer to that. It depends. It's a really case by case discussion. If you have a clear vision of the middle ear to the tympanic membrane perforation, there is no, uh, in my opinion, there's no indication for CT scan. But it really depends. If you are not okay. sure, if you have a. Yeah, as, it, as you know, there is, there's a school of thought which essentially, if you have a, a central perforation and the ear is persistently discharging, there, there is a thinking that there may be a reservoir in the mastoid, and in this situation, uh, if you do a CT scan, that may show you the status of the uh, mastoid bone, and, and you may actually, uh, it, it may entice you to perform uh, some sort of cortical mastoidectomy with the uh, tympanoplasty. So you, you disagree with this school of thought, is it? Yeah, this, I, I don't say I disagree. I say I don't do that. But that's, uh, that's a different uh, way of uh, approaching this right. case. Right. Uh, so that, you know, to... we have cases like this where we have a really huge chronic discharging ear. We try to tr to treat it before doing any surgery, and we cannot stop the discharge. And it, and sometimes we have to do surgery, and we can stop the discharge by chance if we can close the tympanic membrane. So it's very interesting to see that. Do you have uh, the same experience, Simon? 
Yeah, it's pretty unusual to do a cortical mastoidectomy in a patient with a chronically discharging ear when there's only mucosal disease. Right. Um, the the tympanoplasty techniques are very reliable, uh, even in the presence of infection. Um, so uh, there's very few cases where I think it's necessary to do that. Yeah. Hello, yeah. can I comment on this? Please, please go ahead. A few years ago, we had a PhD thesis done in Alexandria where we compared 50 patients uh, with uh, the charge uh, uh, when we did cortical mastoids and the other 50, we did not do cortical mastoids and the closure rate was almost identical. So right. we think cortical mastoid uh, as a regular uh, surgery is not really indicated. So that's really, that's great. So there is agreement between the Egyptian experience and the Europe experience, uh, which is good. Um, now, um, if I take you to the uh, next question there, um, that question would be for Robert Vincent, uh, if you don't mind, Robert, to answer it. Essentially, you've uh, performed stapedotomy on, on this patient, not you, but someone, ha someone else has. Um, and it ended up with a perforation after uh, surgery. Uh, not only that, but actually uh, uh, the audiometry has shown the maximal conductive hearing loss. So you are the surgeon, uh, you actually think that probably the surgery wasn't successful, the stapedotomy wasn't successful. Now, uh, like. <laughs> <laughs> well, the scenario is, You've got a perforation. You're going to explore the middle ear and check the situation of your prosthesis. But uh, would you uh, revise this tapes and you do uh, tympanoplasty at the same time? Or would you actually do tympanoplasty and once you make sure that the, uh, the perforated tympanic membrane has healed up well, then you go in and do your uh, stapes uh, pro uh, procedure? Yes, I would do that in two stages. I would do the graft first, uh, the panic membrane grafting first, and then wait six months at least to be sure about the stability, and then I would do the stapedotomy between six months and one year. So That's the kind of rule. So do you apply this principle for ocicular reconstruction? No. It, it, I just apply that yeah. only for stapes, stapes Why? fixation. That's all. What, what, what is the difference between... If well, I, I, that's an interesting question. Because I think it's a stupid decision because I don't think there is a great risk to do it. But it's a kind of uh, medical legal uh, issue. If we have a complication uh, following that kind of patient, and if you do a, a stapedotomy with a simultaneous tympanic membrane perforation, um, there's a risk that you can have a, the patient will sue you and then you, you're going to lose because you've done this. And in any books, you can see that it's, uh, mandatory to do that in two stages. But I do believe, if you ask me personally, I do believe that it would be possible to do it in one stage for sure. But I always do in two stages. But, but, but the same patient would sue you if you reconstruct the ossicles at the same time you repair... Yes, but, the it, but, it's, but it's not regarded as a contraindication to perform stapedotomy with a, a perforated eardrum. It's in France it's a kind of contraindication. You really so, need to have a closed tympanic membrane before doing stapedotomy. So that is kind of uh, like an agreement in France. Uh, yeah. I wouldn't say yeah. agreement. Yeah. Uh, we not agree about that, but that's, uh, I mean, it, uh, it's, a, it's a rule, yes. So uh, is it the same experience, Simon, in the UK, is it? Yes, we would certainly do that in two stages. I, I, think, I think Robert's quite right. I think it would almost certainly work out fine if you repaired the drum at the same time but there's a little bit more to lose if you get infection or other complications and it would just give you the reassurance um, to have that drum healed before you proceeded with the stapedectomy. So likewise if you uh, do a circular reconstruction with a perforated tympanic membrane you do them simultaneously with no issue in the UK? Yeah. Right. Uh, Prof. Blal, do you have similar opinion? So you see British and French, uh, they, they, do, they do agree. <laughs> well, Occasionally, I, I think. Uh, I, I think what, uh, 
I think what you should do is, uh, depends on the timing that you see this uh, perforation. Usually the tear is not like what you have uh, shown us. The tear happens in the tympanopenatal flap uh, posteriorly, usually where uh, you have turned your, your flap and it has teared from you. So uh, if you're at the time of the surgery, you repair it immediately with uh, a graft or whatever. If no, you no, see it in the post... Prof. Bilal, I'm talking actually, as you can see the perforation, it has healed up. Uh, the perforation is very, it's kind of like an old perforation. It's not immediately. Obviously, if you were in the, at the time of surgery, you would repair it at the same time. But I'm asking actually if it happened later on, uh, kind of depends on uh, when later on because sometimes we see the this kind of perforation posteriorly and we see it in the first two weeks or three weeks and I think uh, this is might be indicated for fat myringoplasty uh, that you would do it uh, for this patient but otherwise if you see this patient few months or a year with uh, with a big perforation like we've seen in your slide then there is no way to do it except staging, of course. No, but mind you, Prof. Bilal, what I'm actually saying, that this patient comes to you with a maximal conductive hearing loss, uh, and you, someone, someone has operated on him uh, a kind of stapist surgery. So you're going to explore yeah. this ear anyway. So you have a perforation, but also stage. you have the maximum, you, you stage it. Of course. So you're going to see. Okay, so this is agreement between Egypt and Europe as well. Great. So now um, the next question is, uh, that question would be for uh, Prof. Bilal. Um, you've got, uh, I'm not sure whether you can see this well or not. This is essentially automycosis uh, with a central perforation of the tympanic membrane. We see this sometimes. And if you clean the E, you cannot really give e drops because they really burn like a hell for these patients, and they may yeah. damage the middle ear mucosa as well. So, how would you manage them? This is a question by one of the our well the 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 target audience in the Facebook group. How would you manage this condition, Prof. Bilal? Uh, repeated suction, uh, Castellani paint that uh, you use uh, use uh, creams antifungal creams uh, right. you don't have to use antifungal drops because if they fall into the middle ear they'll cause a lot of uh, pain but i think uh, frequent uh, ear toilet under the microscope with the uh, suction and uh, painting and uh, putting some antifungal cream and then obviously you have to go and uh, close this uh, perforation because uh, a persistent perforation, the fungus never uh, will always come back. Right. So, uh, any different experience from Robert or uh, Simon? I, I uh, would do the same. I would use uh, antifungus treatment, and uh, usually it works well. But it it needs to be, uh, in my experience, quite a long term treatment for a few weeks to be yeah, sure right. that it's going to work. And the microsuction is particularly important in these cases. I think you have to keep removing the hyphae and the antifungal treatment will, will eventually settle it down. Great. Do you use Castellani paint, Simon, in Britain? In so we, we tend to use something called triad cortil or otocomb. Um, it's got triamcinolone and an antifungal agent um as well as well so it's it's kind of like a domestos for the ear but it works very very well yeah well castellani paint is is really very much used in italy i'm sure of this <laughs> um <laughs> now um the now we come to this question from one of the target audience as well the the uh the question is about the permeatal approach and using a uh, tragal cartilage graft through the perforation without elevating the tympanometer flap via endoscopy. Uh, is any one of you, is anyone has experience in this kind of thing? Yes, occasionally. If you, if you have a relatively small perforation and it's not marginal, um, I use, I use a sort of butterfly graft, which is just a small cartilage graft with a, 
a cut around the rim. So you've got two butterflies, one that goes medial to the tympanic membrane and one that goes lateral. Right. But there's only a very specific type of perforation that I use that for. Um, if the perforation is too big, it never sits very well and it tends to medialize. Um, and if it's marginal, you just can't get it to, to the, the leaves to sit very well either. Great. You now, can use fat also, Ali, for this kind of uh, perforation uh, if it is uh, less than two millimeter. But uh, again, I have to warn you against the the rim of the perforation with the squamous epithelium might be migrating into the middle ear. And uh, in those cases, uh, if the squamous epithelium, you did not freshen up well the edges, then you'll develop a cholesteatoma secondary to your myringoplasty. That's, that's a good point. That's a really good point. So actually, if you have a small perforation and you're refreshing it quite, uh, well, uh, probably I would say quite generously, uh, then you may end up converting it into a medium-sized perforation. And in this situation, fat graft doesn't work, is it? <laughs> True. <laughs> I think that you, you're getting at this point, Prof. Bilal, yeah? <laughs> no, okay. I think you have to introduce your endoscope through the perforation and see the, uh, the, if you use a 70-degree endoscope, then you can see the squamous epithelium, whether it's creeping into the middle ear or not. Uh, yeah, the surface, I mean. That is going to be a bit technical. But anyway, uh, so now they, there's the same uh, question I was actually asking uh, the respectable panelists. Would you prefer tragal or conchal cartilage? That is, that is if you're performing the retroauricular approach or post-auricular approach. Uh, you have got both cartilages available. Would you prefer tragal or conchal cartilage in tympanoplasty in general? I think that question would be for Robert Vincent, if that, okay? Um, as I do always transcanal approach in all my cases, I always try to take the tragal cartilage, uh, pericondrum first. And if I don't have any more uh, tragal uh, pericond uh, pericondrum, then I go to the conca. But I usually I try to... Uh, triangle one first. Yeah, but the question is actually if you were already going to perform a post-auricular approach. Uh, oh, no, I never do. I never do it. So, really, I never had to do it. But right. usually, you now, let me answer with my colleagues in the clinic who are doing this. They sometimes do a posterior approach and they use fascia because of the posterior incision, of course. Uh, fascia. You're going to use fascia. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, any preference, uh, uh, Prof. Bilal or, 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 Prof. Simon, or Prof. Prof. Lloyd, about this? Any, any, Simon. I mean, uh, as to the nature of the tragal cartilage versus the conchal cartilage. Yeah, so almost always I use a permeatal approach. Um, but if it's a very large perforation, I sometimes do use a post oral approach. Uh, in terms of all my tympanoplasties with cartilage, and perichondrium, um, other than the odd exception like the butterfly graft. Um, and I use the perico perichondrium still attached to the cartilage. And in terms of the quality of the cartilage for doing tympanoplasty, I, I find the tragal cartilage is often a little thicker, it's a little bit pitted, um, and elevating the perichondrium around the margin to give yourself a, per a perichondrial rim is often a bit more difficult because there's sometimes adhesions um, where there's little breaks in the cartilage. So in terms of of, as, of a material, I prefer conchal uh, or actually triangular fossa or, or concha symbi cartilage, um, but I don't use that very often. I, I usually end up using the tragal cartilage um, just because I'm doing a permeatal approach most of the time. Yeah, if you allow the moderator to uh, state his opinion, I actually agree with this. Actually, I found actually the conquer, conquer, conquer cartilage is actually more pliable to uh, kind of insinuate it to where you want it to be. But uh, obviously, that is the, uh, my opinion. So uh, I can I see. I contradict you in this, uh, Ali. I find that the tragal cartilage is uh, much better uh, to conform with. Uh, with the middle ear because the conchal cartilage has a curvature 
So, so you, can it, uh, you score. You can score. Much more difficult to use. Look and the uh, trigger it. cartilage is uh, is there, and uh, you use the perichondrium as a graft. And uh, like uh, Robert has said, uh, ninety percent of my cases are trans canal, so it's yeah. there. So no, why no, no, go no, about no. to the conca? Yeah, no, no. If you were to perform trans canal, I think it would be wise to use the tragal uh, cartilage and perichondrium, obviously. But if you're doing retroauricular and you already opened up the plane and it's actually closer to you, uh, and you're not going to make any uh, incision if you're doing post approach to, to harvest the uh, conchal cartilage. But uh, you're going to do a new incision uh, for the tragal cartilage if you already opened the post area. So anyway. I can but see just, that. Uh, just one point. I just want to say that I, I know I mostly no, do not use cartilage. I always use perichondrium. Uh, so yeah. that's that's the main reason why I'm taking also the perichondrium from the traders. I think very, Robert very... We will come to this very debatable point later okay. on in the in the panel discussion because it's a very important point actually. And I think so many questions about the cartilage versus the fascia coming from the uh, audience in this uh, group. So um I see Saad comes in and goes out. Um, so now, um, does any one of the respectable panels do end oral approach in tympanoplasty anymore? No, uh, not myself. And the oral approach, I use it. Uh, I use the vertical part, but do not go out in the uh, like. I do the vertical part inside the canal to, in small canals to get it a little bit bigger to right. fit my self-retaining uh, speculum. And this is a very important point that you have to have a good self-retaining uh, speculum to do the transcanal surgeries. And you have to be very comfortable with it. Uh, right. I have one that uh, I'll tell you about. Uh, this is a Spanish uh, self-retaining uh, mm -hmm. retractor that uh, Prades Jose Prades, maybe, maybe Robert you know, knows about him. He was in Barcelona. And I bought this uh, self-retaining transcanal retractor maybe almost 40 years ago. And I still do surgeries with it. I've done thousands of cases and it's still holding with me. So you have to be comfortable with your retractor. And, uh, that's, I think, I a major if, point. That's a major point to have a speculum holder. That's yeah. that's absolutely important. What yeah. kind of uh, speculum holder are you using, Robert? I'm using uh, uh, the, the, this part. This made it, you know, it's made by. Uh, it was in a clinic before I came, so you must say it's a long one. It's a long-term one now. Uh, it made in two parts, uh, three parts, by the way. One, there is a plate underneath the head of a patient, and then you have two other parts which are connected to uh, to this plate, and they they are two joints, so you can angulate, you know, the uh, and the uh, you can angle the, the speculum to fix this, the to stabilize this, the speculum, which I think is really nice. Right, Simon. So yeah. you're using a different I, one. Yeah, I actually don't use a, a retractor as such when I'm doing permeatal surgery. I I put the speculum in and then put a, a sticky film, a tegaderm or opsite, which whichever one you want to use over the speculum and then i cut a cruciate cut in it and fold the limbs down into the speculum and that supports it and you can still move the speculum around a bit just to get a, a different view if you need to um, and that avoids the need to to have a, a self-retaining retractor right great so now this is a very common question by the audience about the underlay uh, versus the uh, overlay and we all know that this is in relation to the tympanic annulus uh, over and under. Now, uh, uh, probably um, the question is, what are the percentage? Well, rough estimate of the number of cases of that you've done uh, underlay uh, versus overlay, Robert. Robert? Uh, no, I, I, I always use over, over and not over, under. So it's a pure overlay technique. Uh, so, I put the graft uh, from one side of the ear canal to the other side, and over the malleus handle. Okay. So I think there's a there's a, a a differentiation there to be had. I think that the picture showed an overlay, yes. and it showed an overlay underlay. Yeah. But 
but that's different from an underlay. Sure. Yeah. So, so no, just, think, well, probably the picture is not actually the real question. I agree with you, Simon. The, the question is overlay versus underlay. Uh, yeah, so it's Robert, overlay. Robert is saying that actually he, most of his cases, or all his cases, is actually overlay. Hmm. Yes. Yeah. But, I, but then, my, but then the, question, my, the question uh, to Robert, how would you test the circular chain then? But there's not a problem with that. I elevate the flap, and then you go into the middle ear, and then you can check the osicular chain. I well, don't see any issue with that. So that is not actually overlay. Yeah, but for me, overlay is placing the graft over the Mali sandal and over the bony canal. That's a question of definition in turn. No, no, but that's not actually the conventional definition of overlay because uh. my understanding actually has been, and I mean, I'm not sure whether Prof. Pilar or Simon agree or disagree with me, Actually, overlay uh, for me is actually in relation to the annulus. Essentially, you're gonna go in, you left oh, it in panel okay. near the flap, but you you remain superficial or lateral to the annulus, oh, okay. I and then you pluck your graft in. That's uh, not the way I'm using it. So of course it's underlay in that so case, underlay. but Prof. putting Blair, the graft over the bony canal wall. And I think Prof. Blair has answered this. He doesn't do any overlay by the understanding of mine. Yeah, Simon, do you do? Yeah, uh, okay. I mean, I, the overlay, the true overlay technique that you're describing is where you enter the the gap between the outer layer and the fibrous layer of the drum, yeah. and you remove the outer epithelial layer. That's and right. That that's a technique that I don't know that anybody uses in the UK. I have seen it used in the States, um, but it's it's not something that that we use for the reasons that that. Uh, Doctor Aziz mentioned you can have implantation cholesteatomas, and you often get some blunting of the anterior margin with the with the uh, with the onlay technique. The, I do like the underlay overlay technique, which is basically cool. where, which I think is what which, which which is what Robert's talking about. So you yes, lift yes, the, exactly. the malleus off the drum, or the drum off the malleus, and you put your graft on the malleus but underneath the drum and that's yeah. a fantastic technique it really yeah. gives you great support that's the one i'm using that's the yeah, one I'm absolutely using. and it and it really addresses the difficult area which is the superior anterior part of the drum which is where graphs usually fail if they're going to fail because you just can't get adequate support but there, there. there's still a risk of uh, blunting and lateralization that's the negative points of this technique but yeah. Each of them has a negative point. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, this question is for uh, Prof. Bilal. Um, you've got a patient uh, who's a 35-year-old man who comes to your clinic uh, with the audiometry showing 40 decibel conductive hearing loss. On this side, uh, Prof. Bilal. So you've, you've seen a perforation now, uh, uh, and this is the right ear of this patient. Uh, but you see a myringoscleurotic patch, which is quite... Quite a big one. It's almost involving the posterior part of past tensor. Now, the question, uh, actually, this is a question uh, posed by the audience. Um, would you remove the, the myringosclerotic uh, patch or plug uh, or leave it uh, at the time of tympanoplasty? Uh, there are two types of tympanosclerosis. As you know, myringosclerosis, like the one you're showing, this is what I meant, and yeah. Tympan and then ossicular tympanosclerosis. So in this case, you have to definitely explore the ossicles for uh, the mobility. Uh, and yeah, because the, this, is, this is a subsequent question, actually, about the tympanosclerosis. Okay. And this question and then, about my ringosclerosis. My ringosclerosis, you remove if uh, the uh, tympanosclerotic patch is big enough or very big, or it is... Uh, hindering the movement of the handle of the malleus, like in this case, or it is touching in front with uh, the canal wall, so it is hindering the movement of uh, uh, the tympanic membrane. So these are the indications for removing the tympanosclerotic patches in the eardrum. If they are big enough, uh, hindering the movement of the tympanic membrane anteriorly or hindering the movement of the handle of the malleus. So in this particular case, I would uh, dissect the tympanosclerotic uh, patch from the handle of the malleus, remove it, 
and to go ahead with the technique that Robert and Simon are doing, putting the grafts uh, over the handle of the malleus and under the uh, tympanic membrane. Right. So uh, the same experience, uh, Robert and uh, Simon? Um, I would probably remove the plaque, but it really depends on, of course, the problem of, as, as you said, uh, fixation of the malleus sandal or not, and also the thickness of this, of, of this plaque. Because sometimes it doesn't fix the malleus, but it's too thick to, uh, to keep it in place because then it's a problem to place the graft underneath. So in many cases, we have to remove that, in my experience. So now, uh, the same Simon, yeah? Yeah, I think you need healthy tissue for the graft to, or for the epithelialization of the graft post-operatively. And I think I'd rather deal with a larger perforation with healthy epithelium than, uh, than try and get that to heal as it stands. So You uh, never know about the risk of uh, epithelium, epi epidermal engraft also underneath the plaque like this. So it's important to remove it, I think. That's yes. right. That's yeah. right. I think that's, that's an important point as well. Now, if you have a tympanosclerotic plaque that is tethering the ossicular chain, um, how would you deal with it, uh, Robert? You mean a plaque, a, a tympanosclerosis fixing the, the ossicular chain? Yes. Is that... Yeah, in that case, I will dissect, of course, the. it depends what you have. It, it could be a lot of different things because usually when you have tympanosclerosis, you do not have only one single thing. It is uh, very common to have simultaneous uh, eroded incus, for example, and stapes fixation or malleus fixation plus uh, eroded incus or things like this. But I do not stage unless it's not a stapes fixation. If it's a stapes fixation, then I do the stapidotomy six months or one year <laughs> later. No, no. Uh, on the other, on the oh, other case, if we uh, have just Robert, excuse me, Robert, yeah. I, I seem to have lost to you here. So, if you have a plaque that is fixing the ossicles, yes, uh, I... would you leave it or would no. you remove it? No, I remove it. So, if you remove it, don't you risk uh, kind of misplacing the stapes, for example? Because sometimes it's like a concrete is actually uh, fixing. Of Yes. No, there's a, no it's, it's, a, it's, another, it's a different story. If you have a stapes fixation, then I don't touch the stapes unless I have a fixed, uh, closed tympanic membrane. So in that case, I would stage. I would do the graft and then leave the stapes fixed like that and do the second stage. But if there is a plaque which is going into the middle ear and, for example, fixi fixing the stapes, fixing the, the incurs or the malleus with a mobile stapes, then, of course, I would dissect the plaque the, pl the plaque of tympanosclerosis and put a prosthesis on the same stage, removing the increase, for example. It really depends on the situation. So, um, Ali, can I have a can I make a comment on the stapedial tympanosclerosis? Because uh, yeah, go ahead, please. Some sometimes you have a, a, a kind of tympanosclerosis which is soft. It's like an onion, and you can dissect the tympanosclerotic plaque of the uh, stapes foot plate and mobilize the foot plate doing this. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is hard, so you cannot do that, then you have to stage. But sometimes there is soft tympanosclerosis and there is a hard tympanosclerosis and you can differentiate between the two. Yeah. Well, my right. question is about the hard tympanosclerosis that is actually uh, amalgamated with the ossicles. And if you try to remove it, you may risk uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, ossicular uh, disruption, including... Ali, Ali, in that case, what I would do, let me, let's say, each of us, with the technique that we would use, I would separate the increase from the stapes first and try to dissect here the tympanosclerotic plaque. If it works fine, and if I have a mobile stapes, then I will do the, the ossicular plasty on the same stage. But I will always try to remove the tympanosclerosis during the, the first operation, of course. So, well, okay. how about, uh, Robert, sorry, I mean, this is it's really endless question. Yeah, yeah, let's keep going. How about if this, uh, is this actually happened with me? Um, the, 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 the plaque is very uh, tough and encircling the ossicles, including the, 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 the malleus, incus, and the stavis. And now you try to remove the incus uh, amongst this mess of uh, everything is amalgamated together. 
Now, is there a risk for the uh, escape's dislocation? And uh, of course, of course. would would you be would you be probably uh, safer to actually uh, stop doing this procedure and give the patient a healing aid? Yeah, but I, I mean, there's always a risk when you do some kind of surgery, and of course, the decision will be made perioperatively. But it's in my in my experience, it was very rare that I had to stop surgery for tympanosclerosis. Usually, you can really remove the plaque uh, safely, uh, separating the cuts from the stapes. But it, again, it, of course, it depends on the situation. But in my experience, it's very rare. Uh, right. Uh, Simon, uh, you okay experience in this? So I, I agree with Robert. Most of the time, you can remove the, the, the tympanosclerosis, and um, it is softer, and you can definitely tell the difference between the bony tissue of the stapes and the tympanosclerosis. But there's a, a, a risk balance ratio with with all surgery and i think with experience you learn the point at which the risk becomes too much and you uh, are always able to resort to a hearing aid or an implantable bone conduction hearing aid if that's the situation you find yourself in so i think there is no point putting the patient at too much risk um, how you define too much risk is difficult and it yeah. will depend on the surgeon um, de uh, depend on their experience and and uh, their level of skill as well. It's a case, uh, case by uh, case discussion uh, again. Absolutely. Have you, seen, have you seen the Egyptian tough tympanosclerosis patches? Would probably change your opinion. <laughs> I've seen, uh, I've seen uh, that Ali because you remember I went to Egypt to do some kind of surgery, so I remember some kind of thing like that. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Ali, uh, Sad. Uh, sorry, sorry, I, I have uh, some internet and technical uh, problem, and now I uh, I with you. <laughs> no, 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 I, I <laughs> now I with you. <laughs> had an app and then came back to us. Anyway, okay. So, uh, we we'll go for the next question is uh, is about the this patient. I think I'd, I'd like to ask Simon about this. Um, this is a seven-year-old um, boy or girl coming to you with a conductive hearing loss of 35 decibel on both sides. You can see now, Simon, is it clear now uh, on the screen or shall I make it a bit clearer now? Get it, get it bigger. Can you see it now? Yeah. yeah. So essentially, as you can see, the tympanic membrane almost wrapped on the medial wall of the middle ear structures. Uh, and that is on both sides. Yeah. Uh, this child came to you uh, with a conductive hearing loss of 35 decibel on both sides. Um, and you're going to give these, uh, well, the parents, the option, uh, or these options, uh, watchful waiting, hearing aid, long-term ventilation tube insertion with adenoidectomy, cartilage temporoplasty, uh, with or without silastic or balloon tuboplasty. Okay. Which one would you go for, Simon? Um, so, I mean, that's a pretty established uh, ear uh, with p very poor eustachian tube function. And I don't think uh, watchful waiting is going to change the situation, um, but you could watch it and see whether, whether the retraction um, uh, gets worse and you could potentially offer them a hearing aid but that, I, that wouldn't be my number one choice um, I think my number one choice initially would be a, a standard grommet just to see how they respond to that before you proceed with a, a longer term grommet and I, I wouldn't necessarily do an adenoidectomy initially but I would certainly want to assess the nose and see whether there's any disease there that needs needs dealing with and if the adenoids are particularly large or there's chronic rhinosinusitis or other pathology then I, I would deal with that. I think a, a cartilage tympanoplasty that m might give you uh, some strength to the drum but there is a risk when the eustachian tube uh, dysfunction is ongoing that you might get retraction around the edge of the, the, the cartilage graft and it, it wouldn't address the hearing. Um, so I, I wouldn't necessarily use that as a as an option, certainly early on. Um, in terms of balloon tuberplasty, um, I use that pretty regularly in adults. I have to say, 
the the uh, benefits are very variable and i would certainly not say that it's it's a panacea for for curing eustachian tube function but i don't really have any experience of using it in in young children so i probably wouldn't use it in this case so in summary i'd probably just use a normal grommet initially and see how they go and then assess the situation over the coming months great any different opinion from this by the panelists Can I add something yeah uh, I think this case of uh, atelectatic eardrum uh, doesn't have to do anything with adenoidectomy. I think this is an allergic child that has to be treated very well for allergy. I would put a tea tube and uh, wait for him to be 12 or something, then start uh, thinking of cartilage tympanoplasty when he gets older because Atelectatic eardrums, once the T-tubes come out, then he'll get back his conductive hearing loss. Right. So how would this be actually... I mean, the, the, a, this is a question by the audience about preventative tympanoplasty with normal hearing. Has any one of you had experience with this? Uh, Robert, uh, that's a question for Robert. Uh, what do you mean exactly uh, preventive tympanoplasty? Yeah. I would follow the same rule as Simon. I would probably uh, put a tube in this case and wait and see what's going on. We have to do something because we have 30, 35 dB uh, uh, hearing loss. So with young yeah. child, so we have to improve his hearing. Yeah, but uh, I, I, I don't do tympanoplasty in this case. So there's you don't do any preventative tympanoplasty no, yet? No. Okay. Hmm. Now, uh, this question is for... Uh, uh, Professor Saad Zayat. Saad, can you hear us? Yes, yes I hear you. Uh, you've got this uh, patient who's actually 55 with conductive hearing loss uh, of 35 decibel on both sides. And that's a 55-year-old gentleman. Is your choice would be the same like the previous one, the kid, which is probably there is agreement about ventilation tube, or would you deal with it differently? And this uh, I think I think in this age uh, I, I will uh, act uh, differ from a child. Uh, I, I think in this stage I will uh, make uh, uh, full investigation like CT to, to, to see the the the, the mastoid cavity what uh, about it. And I see uh, tympanum sclerosis patches. I think. Uh, 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 in this case, I will uh, explore the, the, the middle ear, and I uh, I, I will make uh, tympanoblasty cartilage tympanoblasty in this uh, in this case. Fantastic. Any any different opinion from uh, the tympanoplasty for this 55 year old man with bilateral conductive hearing loss? Uh, I would do surgery. The, the, the problem here is the retraction that you can see in the attic area. We need to rule out any uh, cholesteatoma. This is, there's in that no, case, I would no, ask for a CT scan. But, no but I would do for tympanoplasty. But okay. the only thing I would add is that, uh, as you can see, there is an increased erosion in this case. So we have to do uh, osteoplasty at the same stage. Um, sure. Simon? Yeah, I mean, the middle ear, it probably is ventilated anteriorly. Um, it's obviously difficult to be sure. Um, but uh, I think a tympanoplasty would probably give you a, a relatively well aerated middle ear and a, an acicularplasty should work quite well. The, the head of the stapes is present. It's likely that the crew are intact and uh, a partial acicular replacement prosthesis should should work pretty well in that situation. I, I agree with Robert. I think um, there is some attic erosion. Uh, you just need to look at that very carefully under the microscope and make sure that there's no keratin accumulating. And there's, if, no, there's no history of ear discharge or anything, and you can see the fundus of it. Uh, yeah, and there's a 55-year-old man. Actually, I, I, to be controversial here, I probably give the patient the choice. And I think the choice of having a hearing aid is not a bad choice here. If I, might, if I may express my opinion, as long as I'm going to follow up this patient, and I know that this patient is quite handy to be seen later on. Uh, I'm not sure whether Prof. Bilal agree with this or disagree with it. 
I think uh, you are turning into a, an audiologist, uh, Dr. Ali. <laughs> no, 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 no. Actually, actually, Simon would agree with me about this. <laughs> well, I, in, in the UK, we would we would counsel them about all the options, and yes, as, as I'm sure everybody would, and you know, it would be his decision at the end of the day. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So I think. But we Simon, should... you always, uh, as a surgeon, you give him surgery as a first choice, right? Uh, well, I, I, I love doing the surgery, but I have to be honest with the patients and tell them everything. Yeah. <laughs> I think the option of hearing aid is, the, is there. But anyway, um, I think we have discussed this before, so we're going to skip it. Uh, now, um, this question is uh, for Prof. Bilal. I've got this patient uh, comes to you with a dry central perforation, uh, but this is the only hearing ear. The other uh, ear, this is, a... <laughs> the other ear is three to profound. What would you do? You of are course, a give now. him, give him uh, no choice. He has to uh, to wear a hearing aid. Great. Any different opinion? No. No. Well, so. No. I, I may disagree a little bit with Aziz. Uh, I, I had to do some sur kind of surgery. I actually in, thought that Romero like would this. say that. When we have this unique uh, ear earring ear, which is, of course, a very difficult decision. But I mean, the, it's a long-term discussion with a patient. I don't see a big issue in, in doing uh, a, a basic tympanic membrane uh, grafting, uh, even in case of only earring ear. Uh, that's another question if you have to do osteoplasty or if you have uh, specifically to do the stapy surgery. So sometimes I do surgery on that case. But uh, but Robert, uh, I've seen, uh, I'm sure you've seen also cases of myringoplasty ending with profound hearing loss. Okay. In fact, I, I've seen a case with bilateral myringoplasty ending with bilateral hearing, uh, profound hearing loss that had to go into cochlear implant, which is was a terrible uh, thing and with medical yeah. legal practice and all of that. Oh, sure. But uh, by chance, I didn't, I didn't cross this kind of situation myself, but of course it can happen for sure. That's all. This is why yeah. it's very important to discuss that with the patient. Uh, I think course. for the sake of, of the target audience, I think we should state to them, no, for this patient, do not operate on them. Uh, mm -hmm. or uh, Robert or, or Simon, or, or yeah, uh, they can do that, but not, not for the uh, junior or the intermediate level doctors. Now, uh, tympanoplasty in a children, and this is a question that posed by so many uh, in the group actually. Is there any minimal age for tympanoplasty? Um, Simon? Mm -hmm. um, it, <sighs> Theoretically, no. Uh, practically, probably yes. I think the difficulties in very young children are, are, are more logistical than anything else. Um, it's very difficult to clean the ear afterwards. And um, obviously, so the, let, me, let me pose the question and what is the youngest that you have performed tympanoplasty on him, uh, Simon? I've done the youngest one I've done was five years old. Um, but I prefer to, to wait a little bit more than that. They're just a bit more compliant. But it, 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 again, it depends on the circumstances. You know, if they're really having a lot of trouble with that ear, then, you know, I would operate on it before that. If it right. Can. So, Dr. Ali? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, for, for the junior, we must uh, differentiate uh, for ear surgery. If, if we have a cruciatoma, we have no age. No age. Sorry, uh, but uh, uh, but we uh, if we have a safe ear, uh, there is a very good uh, meta analysis about uh, the age in uh, in tympanoplasty. Uh, there was a, a relation between uh, the success of tympanoplasty and the age, and uh, the, the 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 age of of ten year in tympanoplasty was the best in this uh, meta-analysis study. So if we have a safe ear, uh, it, it's better to postpone to a uh, 10 year uh, old. I, I think uh, according to the study and, and we, we, we from our uh, practice because in child we have recurrence attack of, uh, of otitis media. So the failure, uh, I think, uh, more uh, than uh, adult. So, Robin, Robe, what is the youngest that you have done tympanoplasty on him or her? I just check on my database. 
It's five five year old, same as Simon. That's but that's, again, again, it's an important question. Because Child comes to you with persistent ear discharge, and you look at the ear. You can see some polypoid middle ear mucosa, and the ear is persistently discharging. You you keep giving them local medication, systemic medication. Uh, they come back to you with persistent discharge. You scan them, and there's no evidence. There is what well, you you cannot see any cholesteatoma matrix, and so it's not really cholesteatomatous disease. Um, what would you do with these children? Would you would you just say I'm not going to operate on them? No, as I said before, I always try to dry out the, the the ear first if I can. But if it doesn't work, then we have to do surgery at one point. So, and I have had to do it in some cases, and by chance it worked. Not, I mean, the, the success rate is about the same. So it's so, very strange. So, so the, the only way to stop the disease sometimes is to perform the op the operation. I see. So, Prof. Bilal, do you have any younger than five? Uh, I think the, the, the crucial thing about children is uh, allergy. Usually, uh, those uh, kids that come with uh, bilateral discharging ears, they had middle ear effusions that were uh, mistreated and then uh, perforated their eardrums and... Their noses are terrible. Uh, they have adenoids, they have uh, sinusitis, uh, chronic nasal allergy. So you have to keep on treating those and delay as much as possible uh, their surgeries. If uh, they do not oh. have allergy and they have bilateral perforations which are dry, uh, the problem is the hearing loss when they are entering the school. So the school age of six is the critical age where you have to provide some good hearing for these kids before sending them to school. So we right. operate on them usually between five and six. Right. Okay. Uh, great. So what so you're talking about, much younger, of course, if uh, I just uh, operated on a one-year uh, case with bilateral congenital uh, atresia of the external canal. So yeah, some children you have, <laughs> some children you have to do them very early. Right, great. So now um, we'll come to the osiculoplasty bit. I think the, the t determinants of the outcome of osiculoplasty is, is a quite a big list, as you can see there. But we know that the uh, in osiculoplasty, if you keep the tension and alignment, these are important factors to maximize the hearing gain in, in osiculoplasty. I think that question is for uh, uh, Robert Vincent is, in case of absent tapey superstructure, apart from TOE, what would you do? And how would you counsel your patients? So essentially, there's no state of superstructure. Uh, what we do here in Egypt, in many parts of the world, is actually do TOE. Do you do it differently? I know you have Special techniques, Robe, about these things. Uh, you do them differently. Yeah. Well, I, I, as you know, I always do torp, a total reconstruction. Also, despite the presence of stapedial arch, when when the stapes is present with elastic bending technique, but that's not the case here. Yes. So I would use a torp. But the problem here would be to stabilize the prosthesis. And as you know, I've introduced this technique of malus replacing prosthesis. So I would put uh, the malus replacing prosthesis first. I I prefer to do that in two stages. So I will insert the malice replacing prosthesis first, wait six months, and then go back for the second stage and put a torp from the new malus to the stapes full plate because the, the presence of the malice prosthesis will increase the chance of prosthesis stability. In that case, if you don't put something to stabilize the prosthesis, the success rate is, if you go to literature, and that's what I had before, is no, no more than 30% of success rate. So it's very, very low. So I would use this kind of technique now. Right. So, so you would not use the old-fashioned, uh, as in top with a cartilage on the tympanic membrane, as we do sometimes. Yeah, but the problem is that if you put cartilage, it's because you want to stabilize the prosthesis. But how do you stabilize the cartilage itself? That's always the same problem. That's you, right. you, uh, it's not stable. 
I, there's and a well, great risk. Do you have any experience with bone cement in osteopenic plasty? Not myself. Right. Uh, no. um, anyone else has a, has an experience with with bone we, cement? We have uh, yeah. we have in Alexandria extensive uh, experience with bone cement, especially in the incudus tapedial uh, dis, uh, disruptions. I yeah. think it's a, it's a very useful uh, uh, in this particular situation where uh, you put a drop of cement. Uh, we, and even we have used bone cement now to stabilize the uh, stapedectomy prothesis over the, the long process of the incus because yes. we thought yes. that uh, the long-term necrosis of the long of the uh, long process uh, post-epidectomy occurs because of the excessive movement of the. Uh, so we crimp and then put a drop of bone cement, but in osiculoplasty, it is very useful really in uh, this situation. Well, uh, I think using bone cement and step is we uh, we've published this in otology neurotology two years ago. Actually, is very good, but the main problem with it is that if you had to revise your surgery, then everything is amalgamated there, Prof. Bilal, isn't it? Uh, well, I don't have uh, revision stapedectomies. I don't know oh, about fantastic. you. Fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. Uh, fantastic. Dr. Uh, Dr. Ayatli? Yes? Uh, I, I think uh, uh, the problem of uh, stability of uh, prosthesis and uh, loss of sobra stable structure uh, we can use cartilage shoe, uh, a piece of cartilage, perforated, and uh, pass the prosthesis from it. It 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 uh, will make uh, more stability for the prosthesis. I tried it in many cases and work uh, good. Yes, but the, the issue with this side is that uh, you're gonna pass the prosthesis through the hole uh, in the cartilage. The hole in the how, cartilage yeah. how about the rim of the cartilage itself? It needs to be fixed. How would you fix the rim of the cartilage? Uh, no, I, I don't uh, fix it. Just gel foam uh, around this uh, part of uh, of cartridge. Uh, yeah. I, I I think it uh, it will uh, work good. Right. Great. So now, uh, Ali, uh, can I add uh, can I add something about uh, staging? If you're doing osiculoplasty and you are grafting the eardrum. The eardrum, until uh, uh, it heals, uh, it is unstable. And the hearing results using the prosthesis in the first stage are not usually very good. So I think if you stage and come back six months later to put a, a torp or a titanium or whatever you're going to use, I think you're going to uh, have more stable yeah. Uh, situation where you get better hearing results. I do agree. So staging is a good idea also. Uh, I, I do agree. I do agree totally. Staging um, for total replacements I think is important. I'm not quite so sure it's that important for the partials um, because the partials are much more stable and you can usually yeah. get a good result with that. With the, with the torps, I mean, I, I use the Kurt system and they have a very nice Amiga shoe which sits in on the foot plate of the stapes and it, that does offer a degree of additional stability yeah, right. the distal part of the prosthesis it doesn't completely get around the issue and, and the outcomes are still not as good as a partial uh, replacement but um but but i do find that that helps significantly great um let us uh, go with this uh, very common question by the audience which is about ostation tube dysfunction uh, the first question uh, in relation to this topic is how does the eustachian tube dysfunction uh, affect the choice of my graft, fascia versus uh, cartilage? Uh, does it affect the choice of the graft, uh, Sam? Yes. Uh, first thing, uh, I think uh, is, a, is a another ear is a mirror of, uh, of this is the ear. Uh, see the another ear if retracted, uh, mostly it uh, second tube dysfunction, and I go directly to cartilage preconderum graft. Uh, any any uh, similar experience with the others, or oh, fascia can be okay with that? I use cartilage for everything, so um, I don't have to make a decision. But but um, okay, my feeling would be that if there is ongoing significant eustachian tube dysfunction, then cartilage would probably be pre preferable to fascia. 
Fair enough. Now, uh, the, the subsequent question to uh, in the same topic is, in case of recurrent otitis media or diffusion with numerous bromid insertion, would you tackle the problem by T-tube insertion or would you actually go for a tuboplasty? I think that question for Simon, because you do tuboplasty, Simon, I know that. Yeah, I mean, I, I discuss it with the patient. And if I'm honest, the, the, the best results I've had is if I use a grommet and then a tuberplasty at the same time, and that seems to extend the um, period that the ear is clear after the grommet comes out. But you know, that's not really got any significant evidence base. Um, yeah, so, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd, I'm not overly convinced that balloon eustachian tuberplasty is, is a fantastic intervention for patients. Right. Okay, so probably the last question in this panel is about the experience with the subannular T tube insertion. Anyone mm. has experience in this of the respectable panelists? Yeah, I've, I've used it a few times and I think it's great. Um, the only problem is the T tube gets a bit crusty and you have to clean it fairly regularly. But um, you, if you've got somebody with a chronic um, middle ear problem and um, you've had to repair the tympanic membrane and you don't want to put a, a hole in the drum, an extra annular T tube is, is quite a good option for them. So the subannular one? Yeah. Great. Any more experience with this, Prof. Bilal, Robert, Saad? No, no. Uh, yes. I, I, I think in, in, uh, in recurrence, uh, test media with suffusion with very acrophatic or syndrome, I think T tube or, or any intervention uh, will end with uh, perforation of the drum. So I, I think in this case, cortical mastectomy with uh, cartilage tympanoplasty, I think uh, it will be uh, one of, 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 uh, of solution in this situation. Uh, right. Anyone agree with me in this concept? I don't actually all disagree with you, Sam, because they don't like cortical <laughs> mastectomy. And I know that when you were uh, off the stage. Anyway, yeah. uh, we've come to the end of our panel discussion. Uh, I would like to thank you immensely, all of you, for your contribution, particularly our uh, sincere friends from Europe, uh, Rope uh, 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 Vincent and uh, Simon Lloyd. Uh, and uh, equally important is to thank uh, our dear professor, Aziz Bilan, and my colleague, uh, Abzad. So thank you very much indeed uh, for your time. I, I totally appreciate your help. And I hope this is useful to the uh, target audience in this platform. And thank you so much again and have a good night. Thank you, Ali. Thank you very much. Bye bye. bye, -bye. I'm happy, Ali, that uh, we had uh, similar opinions in uh, France, Britain, and Egypt. We did not. <laughs> it's not because, uh, you know, much. as is it, it's. It's just because we are very polite. It's because we are very polite. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm happy to see Sad. How are you, Sad? Nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see you after 10 years. <laughs> but I hope thank you for your... Yeah. Yeah. I thank you. <laughs> and I hope, Ali, we'll, I hope you will that you would, uh, you would touch on the, on the future of Maringoplasty. Robert, do you think that the 3D engineering will affect yeah. our techniques in the future? Actually, this Might question be. was not put, put to me by the audience. That's why I'm just giving you the question by the target group. Well, basically. So. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> really, I'm not sure about that. I still <laughs> okay. think that yeah, it's yeah. better to use the uh, human uh, tissue, if possible. I think so. Great. So I hope you are holding uh, up uh, okay in the UK and France in this COVID-19 issue. Yeah. yeah, you too. Yeah. Thanks very much again. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you.